2011 studies, I want to quote a couple things from Seven Years to a Better Tomorrow. Um, we we looked at Elijah and how his um, how God was showing how Elijah's prayer for no rain in the three and a half years, and then he prayed again and there was rain. That the separation uh, it seems like to be a seven year separation, the midway point being the halfway mark of the seven years, and that's what we're in right now. Um, and he also mentioned Job, and it's fascinating in Job, this is on page uh, 263, um, the chapter is 11, the blood moon tetrad of 2014 and 15. Um, with Job, the number seven shows up in the following ways. Job had seven sons, Job had 7,000 sheep, doubled to 14,000 after the trial of Satan. Um, for seven days and seven nights, Job's friends sat in quietness due to Job's grief. And in Job 15, 19, there's a verse that says, He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven uh, there shall no evil touch thee. God commanded Aliphaz uh, to offer up seven bullocks and seven rams as Job was to pray for all three of his friends. Seven is really uh, prominent in the book of Job. Um, so that was something interesting to point out. I also wanted, there's some comments made after the last study, which um, I wanted to read this from, when I, when I publish a study, I put the topic underneath of the study, and I do that for a reason, so people will know, well, is this something I've watched before, or is this something I've heard of on 2011 studies before, or is this something new? Um, and this is what it read, this study will look at the importance of the, the Tabernacle's blood moon on September 27, 28, 2015. Why is Tabernacle so important? We will also look at the language of the consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. What is this all about? When does this happen? Now that was a topic of the last study. And this is part two of that. We're going to read some more verses on uh, the consumption and the righteousness that overflows. And that seems to be really showing um, a time of, great, of God's great reversal once again, like Joel 2, like other passages in the Bible where God reverses the captivity, turns the captivity, and there's, there's a, a really good time. Um, so in, in order to show, now the questions that came or they were actually comments. Where I, I didn't bring up the um, the wall, the Amaya's wall, um, and I didn't bring up uh, Ezra. Uh, how Ezra, Ezra went to uh, Jerusalem and he taught the statutes and judgment by the decree of Artaxerxes, saying, "Go." And uh, the whole thing there is we've talked about that before. We've there's a whole uh, video on that uh, Nehemiah um, and. That's up on, I think I have the title, I'll mention the title, but it's uh, it's up on 2011 slides. You can just go through and, and look at the videos and, and find that. And that was a whole video on how this happens. It is not by decree of God sending one man like he sent Ezra. It's not by the decree of sending uh, Nehemiah and the wall was built in 52 days. Um, even though there may be a relationship with that 52 days. but. It was more of that God will do it. I pointed this out in the book, Seven Years to a Better Tomorrow. It is God who does that. God who, who puts his spirit in people and then teaches the statues and judgments like Ezra did. Um, it is God who builds the walls of salvation by his spirit. So because I don't mention something in one video doesn't mean that I haven't mentioned it before. And uh, all this means is if you if you want this information, you can go back and look at it. It's all it's all documented. It's all there. It's it's in the book Seven Years to a Better Tomorrow. Um, you can read that on 1335days.com for free. Uh, let's see, that would be page uh, 364. Now I wanted to read this because you know if people think that I have not covered this or I don't mention it in one video the only reason is is because we're talking about new topics we're talking about the consumption and and the consummation that happens um, and even in the book of Daniel when I was reading that the wall will be built in, in troublous times in the last study in the context of the the uh, consumption that will uh, be overflowed by righteousness in the context of that it was mentioned but anyway this is page 364 statutes and judgment come about by God's Spirit. 
After seeing that the year 2018 is a possible time for the return of Jesus in power and great glory, I cannot help but think that the year 2015 will be the time of God's reversal. The, the beautifying of God's temple, the teaching of God's statutes and judgment in Ezra, and the building of the wall in Nehemiah all relate to the final years of history. The, the difference in our time, though, is that God is the one who beautifies His eternal house, builds the wall of salvation, and brings forth His statutes and judgment as He saves by His Spirit. Lastly, I want to present a few verses that show how this, the activity of Ezra and Nehemiah relate to our time and truly we're forecasting God's incredible salvation plan. Now this is Ezekiel 36:25. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a new heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Now that's what Ezra went to do. He went to teach statutes and judgments in Jerusalem. And <clears throat> the timing of all that as far as I'm concerned is is going to happen within the seven years because as when God saves somebody and he puts his spirit in somebody that is building the wall of salvation that is teaching statutes and judgments it's not reliant on any one man doing anything because God's going to be doing it with it by his spirit saving um, now this is Isaiah 26 1 now this is talking about the walls in that day Shall this song be sung in the land of Judah? We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for the walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in, that will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. Um, now I also said... <clears throat> We can all be anticipating something very incredible happening in the following months and years. We have all been living so long in a time of evil that when God shakes the heavens and the earth and executes a great reversal, His people will be rejoicing. Righteousness will come in as a flood. God's word will be magnified and His glory will cover the earth. People will become saved by His Spirit and God will be magnified. So that's on page 364 and 365. Um, if you wanted to read about the the um, what Nehemiah or the comparison to Nehemiah and Ezra is all about, and also um, there's a whole there's one or two videos up. I, I think I know there's one for sure. Uh, the Tirshathra, and uh, I think that's the title of it, Nehemiah the Wall Builder, and you can look that up. So I wanted to make that comment for the people who are you know saying well you didn't mention this in this study it, there's a reason you know it's hard to put everything in a 45 minute study I mean it really is you got to keep the time down um, for number one for my camera it only goes up to an hour so I try to do that for that reason I could have longer studies but I try to keep them low um, so anyway the the blood moon we passed and um, got some incredible pictures on that and I'll, I'll post them uh, that was a really incredible looking even though some of the clouds were were covering it um, now as far as the last comment I was making Ezra did come to Jerusalem in the fifth month in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes um, we can compare what Ezra did with the teaching of statutes and judgments to God saving people today that is how the wall is built and that is how salvation comes forth and, and the statutes and judgment God will teach by putting his spirit into people and so that's the important um, aspect of this and I wanted to also emphasize the fact that God will do it he will do it he even says that in Ezekiel 36 let me read this because I read a little bit from the book on Ezekiel, but I wanted to read this this section of Ezekiel 36 because it, it's really incredible to, to look at how God does this. 
Um, Ezekiel 36, 6. Prophesy therefore concerning the land of Israel, and say to the mountains, and to the hills, to the rivers, and to the valleys. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy, in my fury, because ye have borne the shame of the heathen. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I have lifted up mine hand, surely the heathen that are about you, they shall bear their shame. But ye, O mountains of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches, and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are at hand to come. For behold, I am for you, I will turn unto you, and ye shall be tilled and sown, and I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it, and the city shall be inhabited, and the wastes shall be built, builded. And I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring forth, I mean, bring fruit. And I will settle you after your old estates, and will do better unto you than at your beginnings. And you shall know that I am the Lord. That's very similar to Job, how, how God doubled things. Yea, I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess thee, and thou shalt be their inheritance, and thou shalt no more henceforth bereave them of men. Thus saith the Lord God, Because they say unto you, the Thou land devourest up men, and hast bereaved the, thy nations, therefore thou shalt deliver men no more, neither bereave the nations any more, saith the Lord God, neither will I cause men to hear in thee the shame of the heathen any more, neither shalt thou bear the reproach of the people any more, neither shalt thou cause thy nations to fall any more, saith the Lord God. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, and saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and their own doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land, and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries. According to their way, and according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered unto the heathen, whether they went, they profaned my holy name, and they said unto them, These are the people of the Lord, and are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for my mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whether they went. Therefore say, un, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do this, I do this not, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whether ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and bring you un into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols. I will, will I cleanse you. And this is the verses we were talking about. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and will call for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree, increase, and the increase of the field, that they shall no more reproach of famine, oh not, no, that they shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in the sight for your own iniquities, in your own sight for your own iniquities and for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I do this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you, 
Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord of God, In the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the waste shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, where, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, This land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste in the desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Um, this, uh, oh, the, um, I got one more here. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, built the ruined places and plant that that was desolate, and I, I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. That was the emphasis I want to say that God does this. He is the one who does this. Because when we're talking about building the wall, when we're talking about all that, when we're talking about statues and judgments, it is God who does that. We can assume that that's going to happen. We don't have to, you know, try to detail any type of fine plan or anything about that. We just know that when God's Spirit goes forth, He builds the wall of salvation. He teaches the statutes and judgments. Now, there are going to be periods of time um, within the seven years there are going to be a great increase of this. And I believe 2017 and 2018 are great years of salvation. I really believe that from all the studies that I've done on this. And it seems that number 17 is showing up in great, great ways during that time. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where... You know, we just rely on God that His Word's going to come to pass. And when He says, I will do it, we know He will do it. Um, point two about this is we're going to pass October the 7th, the 2015 date, um, in a few days here. And that's why I'm recording this study now. Uh, we're going to pass that. They are not following the pattern of the Great Tribulation, uh, which it, at the time of Jacob's trouble, which is from 2011 to 2018, um, there's numerous videos up on 2011 studies. You can go back and uh, look around the year 2011-12 when I first released the information about um, the seven years following 2011. Um, so we are going to pass October the 7th, 2015. I have recently seen um, what's happened in those groups. It seems like every man's sword against his brother type of situation is happening. Um, they're asking for money, and these money, uh, this money uh, is supposed to go toward these trips. And, the, you know, one group is saying God's going to save a lot of people during these last uh, 10, 7 days, whatever it is, of October. Um, and then, uh, last 7 days of October. And then uh, another group is saying there's still no more salvation, and October 7th is still the end. So there you have the two groups. They both believe October 7th is still the end. However, one believes that God's going to save a lot of people and uh, during that final seven days, and then the other group still doesn't believe their salvation. We need to pass that date. We need to get by that to show that God's Word is true. We have, we have talked about it. I, I released five videos on um, refuting the No More Salvation uh, teaching. That teaching is up. Uh, you can look back on those and know that God has a covenant with uh, day and night, that covenant is solid. It cannot be broken by any man. Salvation will go to the end. Uh, Christ stood up on the last day of the great feast of tabernacles and, and, and cried out, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink the water. That's the, the same as the book of Revelation. He has said um, at the end of the Revelation, he has said that. So we know salvation goes toward the end. Um, the precious fruit of the earth that um, will come forth in James 5. First, the early and latter rains have to come, just like in Joel, the great reversal of Joel. We've seen that. We've illustrated and demonstrated that uh, from God's Word. All this language of the precious fruit of the earth coming forth, that is talking about salvation. And that is why God is long-suffering. He's long-suffering past the 7,000 years um, since the flood in 2011. That last seven years is a great time of God changing things. And But we first had to enter this three and a half years, what appeared to be a famine. A famine of really hearing God's Word. And uh, with his, the declaration whether you're talking about the churches or you're talking about outside the churches where people are declaring no more salvation, you know, we've entered a date of judgment. That is so wrong, it is so off, that once we pass October the 7th in a few days, I think a lot of people are going to, you know, come to the realization that that teaching has been very, very wrong. And uh, the world didn't end because they are not following the pattern that God has laid out historically. And you can go back and look at some of those videos and, and see the, what the pattern is. I don't want to keep on going back 
to former things that we've already talked about um, unless it's for the sake of uh, you know people who are new and but then again I, I'm offering this book seven years to a better tomorrow to anybody for free if you want a hard copy I can mail you one if you don't you can get it online at 1335days.com and read it right online um, which sometimes is harder to do online but still the books available um, now we learned last time that this consumption is very significant. The word consumption, consummation, um, it's phrased a couple ways. And we were focusing on Isaiah 10. This is Isaiah 10:22. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return, the consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption, even determine in the midst of all the land. Therefore saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwelleth in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. Now when God mentions the king of Babylon, the Assyrian, Gog, G-O-G, he's talking about the works of Satan. And even though he's using historical context of the, the Assyrian, um, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, um, Gog, who is an historical figure of the past, he's, he's showing what Satan will do at the end. He shall smite thee, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. And that's another. The Pharaoh is another example of uh, what Satan does, pursuing God's people. For yet a little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. Isaiah 28, 21. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Now therefore be ye not mockers, lest your bands be made strong, for I have heard from the Lord of the Lord God of hosts a consumption even determined upon the whole earth. Now God mentions two battles, uh, two historic battles in these verses, Mount Parazim and the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. Now he mentions these um, uh, in Isaiah uh, 10:26 and Isaiah 28. Um, yeah, Isaiah 28:21. So that Isaiah 28:21 is Mount Perizim. Uh, he shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. And when you're studying Perizim, you have to look up Baal Perizim, um, or the Hebrew number. I put that. I'll post the Hebrew number uh, for the concordance. Uh, because if you just type in Perizim, it's not going to come up. It's Baal Perizim, but they've just the King James translators have, have put that uh, just worded it different. So you have to look up that uh, per Baal Perizim or Baal Perizim. And see, so um, Isaiah ten twenty six speaks of the uh, the slaughter of Midian at the Rock of Oreb where he introduces this battle, and the Lord God of Hosts shall stir up a scourge from him according to, according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb and his rod as his rod was upon the sea so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt um, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and thy yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing that's interesting language um, that, that's more than likely talking about God's spirit saving and changing things. Now the defeat of Midian, God restricted the number of Gideon's army from thousands to only 300. Um, this is talking about the, the Mount, um, I'm sorry, the, uh, this is the um, uh, Oreb, Mount, uh, what happened to the Midianites. The defeat of Midian. God restricted the number of Gideon, Gideon's army from thousands to th only 300. The camp of the enemy was as locusts and their camels as the sand of the seashore. Yet God did his reduction. He, re he reduced the army of Gideon so that Gideon or the Israel can't say we did it because we have great armies. In other words, it's God's action once again. He is showing that this is totally totally reliant on God and his action. Um, the blowing of the shofar and the breaking of pitchers. Now this is Judges uh, 7.18. We're looking at this because God is claiming, the Lord is claiming that he is going to do it 
as in the Battle of Oreb and as what happened in uh, uh, Mount Perizim. He's going to do it according to that. And what's fascinating is in both accounts, it's God's action. It's completely God's action that brings us to pass. It's not some great army that does it. Uh, he pretty much goes before the people and he does it and then the, the believers will reap the, the awards of that. Um, so this is Judges 7.18. When I blow with a trumpet, um, now that's the trumpet of shofar. Okay, so that's the shofar. <laughs> now when you have 300 of those blowing, and a lot of them are longer and bigger, so when the, with the, the sound overall, when a lot of them are blowing, is can be an intimidating sound. It probably wasn't when I just did that, but... Anyway, I'm going to use that in the music video. That's why I have it. Um, when I blow with a trumpet, shofar, and all that are with me, they blow with... They blow ye the trumpets also on every side of the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. Uh, that's fascinating language, the beginning of the middle watch. And they had hardly uh, newly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew the trumpets and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Chita and Zeriath, and also the borders of Ab Abel Mehola. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that one right. And unto uh, Tabath. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. So Gideon sent messages throughout uh, all Mount Ephraim saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before and take before them the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. And all the men of Ephraim gathered to themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. Now the, the emphasis I wanted to make here is how um, when the trumpets were blown, the 300 blew the trumpets. <laughs> Uh, they set every man's sword against his fellow. We're seeing some of that. We're seeing. I've seen some of this activity in in the houses of God, where uh, people walk into other churches and stand up and start decrying this church is wicked. And it it seems like this whole uh, every man's sword against his brother is happening uh, in certain aspects right now. And even with this no salvation doctrine, you're seeing that. There's a split, and you know one group is saying there is salvation, even though it's for a short seven days or whatever, and then the other group is saying there's still no more salvation. So um, you're seeing some of this activity that God has, is bringing about, and I think this is a foreshadow of a really some big events that are going to happen um, where, where God does this in a huge way uh, that every man's sword will be against his brother. Um, now what about Mount Perizim? That's the, the other aspect that God says as Mount Perizim. Something's going to happen similar to Mount Perizim. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. This is Isaiah 28, 21. He, he shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Now therefore be ye not mockers, lest your bands be made strong, for I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption even determined upon the whole earth. Now when researching Perizim, you need to look for Baal 
B-A-A-L Perazim and David's battle against the Philistines as he inquired of God. He inquired a couple times, should I go up against the Philistines? Should I go up? God says, you go up. The one time he said, don't go up. You wait behind them and go amongst the, the mulberry trees. It's baka. I think that's translated as weeping trees. Um, they translated as uh, the mulberry trees, uh, the King James translators. So you have, you have that language of waiting by the trees and, and the rustling of the wind comes or God's spirit and God goes before and then they, they follow. So you, it's a matter of waiting for God in that instance in Perizim. That's you know that's very fascinating because this is what you know God has said in His Word that you wait for Me. Blessed are all those who have waited. Um, and that's an emphasis that has to be shown. And um, the whole idea of this was to defeat the false worship, the false gods, and. Uh, the one was who broke forth upon David's enemies because God was the one. He's the one who who broke forth and and you know created this. Um, I shall do it. You see, you hear this language over and over again in God's word, where He is the one who's doing this. So we don't have to concern ourselves of like any man being so great or something. It's it's all about God's action. Every, absolutely all about God's action. Now this is the, the story of this in uh, 1 Chronicles 14 and we're showing how the battles of Oreb and Perizim uh, it was God going before them and creating the defeat of the enemy and that's what is going to happen. Uh, first, first Chronicles 14 9 and the Philistines came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephim I think that means giant, the valley of the giant and David inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines, and wilt thou deliver me them into mine hands? And the Lord said unto him, Go up, and I will deliver them into thine hand. So they came up to Baal Perazim, and David smote them there. Then David said, God has broken God hath broken in among let me read that again. Then David said, God has broken in upon mine enemies by mine hand like the breaking forth of waters therefore they shall call the place call the name of the place Baal Perazim and when they had left their gods there David gave a commandment that they should they would be burned with fire David gave a commandment and they were burned with fire and the Philistines yet again spread forth themselves abroad in the valley Therefore David inquired again of the of God, and God said unto him, Go not up after them, turn away from them, and come upon them over the over against the mulberry trees. Now here he's asking again, should I go up? And he says, Do not go up. You know, turn away from them and come up uh upon them over the mulberry trees. And it shall be when they shall hear a sound of going in the tops of the mulberry trees, the, the baka trees, uh, weeping trees, then that then thou shalt go, go out to battle, for God is gone forth before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. David therefore did as God commanded him, and they smoked the host of the Philistines from Gibeon even to Gezer. And the fame of David went out into all the lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. Very significant because David is an illustration of Christ. And the fear of Christ will be known into all the nations. When God performs these works, these strange acts um, that he mentions, strange works, he will be magnified. Um, now, in both battles of Oreb and Perazim, it was God going before them and creating the defeat of the enemy. How does God bring about his strange act and his strange work? I think Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, has the answer. God uses the enemy to come against the fallen house of God. It is called the day of the heathen. Yet after this, the heathen that were used as the enemy have to then face God's judgment. 
So indeed, that's a, a strange act, a strange work. This is Ezekiel 31. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Howl ye, woe worth the day, for the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day, it shall be the time of the heathen. Thus saith the Lord God, I will make the multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Remember, Satan is a, an illustration of what Nebuchadnezzar did. Or Nebuchadnezzar is an illustration of what Satan does at the end. He and his, and his people with him, the terrible of the nations, shall be brought to destroy the land. And they shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. And I will make the rivers dry and sell the land into the hand of the wicked. And I will make the land waste. And all that is therein by the hand of strangers, I the Lord have spoken it. That's that same word, I believe, strangers, the strange act that God does. Um, Thus saith the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols, and I will cause their images to cease out of Noph. And there shall be no more prince in the land of Egypt, and I will put a fear in the land of Egypt. Now, on one hand, God creates every man's sword against his brother. That was one of the illustrations. And the other hand, God uses, well, he does go before and destroys the idols. He goes before as we wait for him to do this action, and the false worship is destroyed. And God also uses the enemy to destroy the idols of false worship. So the time of the heathen, I really believe we've entered that now because you're seeing uh, how the heathen is destroying idols across the lands right now, and yet it's it it is just like a possibly a first instance of the grander picture that's going to come um, as we go on in the months ahead. Now I wanted to mention Nam one six because I mentioned that last time. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an over, overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. And when you read this utter end, you're talking about consumption. That's the same, same word. When you do imag- what do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up for the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. This is there is one uh, there is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. When you see that word wicked, it's uh, Belial. It's similar to the word Belial, and it's it's uh, the wicked prince of Israel. It's mentioned a few places. I mentioned it in the book Seven Years to Better Tomorrow, how that is related to Satan, the the wicked one. And when you see the word wickedness and what they're doing, uh, the wickedness that is under the control of Satan, what they're doing in the fallen houses of God, you see this language and you realize that. Yes, this is this is God's warning against the wicked, and um, no matter what Satan attempts to do, he is, he attempts to change uh, times. He attempts attempts to change the times and the laws, and we're seeing that the the laws are attempted to be changed right now. Um, and we're entering a time where a lot of the stuff that had been hidden is coming to light and we're seeing that slowly happening. Um, We talked about uh, in the last few studies how the book of Esther is so important because from Nisan to Adar the casting of the lots was done and God says to be ready against that day and if truly if this year um, was the, has Haman was the illustration of what Satan does attempting to destroy the Christians out of, out of the kingdom um, if truly this is a year from 2015 to 2016 when we hit Adar in 2016 around March 
um, if that is the grand reversal time of God reversing things, then that's going to be a great time because that's when the letters of peace and truth will go out in a great way. And it is very possible. The more I look at that, it's a very good possibility that God has done this this way um, for the halfway mark um, of the seven years. Um, you know, if whether it happens in another year, 2016, 17, 18, but we just approach this in the way that we know the book of Esther is very related to God performing a great reversal. We have the time frame of it uh, from Nisan to Adar, and that word Adar uh, is a month, a name of a month, but it also means to be glorified or magni uh, magnificent, to be magnified. And that's what happens in like Joel 2 when God is magnified. And so we, we're trying to tie all these accounts together um, to show how during that uh, past the halfway mark that God is going to be magnified and um, the precious fruit of the earth will come forth and how God will be, His word will cover the earth like, like the seas and like the waters. So the grand emphasis, though, is that God's judgment, when it falls, people will fear that, you know, fear Christ, because it's like the fear of David that came on uh, the people for what God did. And David is an illustration of Christ himself. So we have this, this language of the consumption. Um, We've we got to look at it more, though, because there's, there's more in the book of Daniel and there's other language. Uh, but we have to, you know, just take things um, in stride, and we're going to pass the 10,000 day, um, October the 6th, since the start of the tribulation, uh, May 21, 1988. And the 10,000 day includes the 8,400 days, and it includes the, like the halfway mark of the seven years, which we're in right now, the final seven years. And yes, God is the one who's going to build the wall of salvation. He is the one who's going to put His Spirit in people and teach His statutes and judgments. Uh, we can just rest assured in that, That's, that we've covered that before, and we know that God is the one who does that. So if I don't happen to mention that, within the seven year context know that it's it's already been taught it's already been shown by God's word that he is the one who does this by his spirit and that's an important aspect 2011 studies um, will continue God willing and we'll have more um, information once we pass um, the October 7th date so we can get back on track and really showing how the gospel goes forth into all the world and then the, the end will come as a witness unto the nations and then the end will come. So that's it for now. God bless you and uh, continue to study the word consumption as you look uh, further into God's word. Thank you.